Hello friends, welcome to the Odonata Taxonomy webinar series. I will be discussing about the larval taxonomy of rodents. I have planned my lecture in two sessions. The first session will deal with the introduction of Odonata life history, the uh, understanding of behavior and ecology of the larva and of course the collection and preservation methods for larvae and exome. And the second session will deal with the basic taxonomy, understanding the key characters and identification of some common uh, families and genera of odonates. So let's start. We already know how an adult dragonfly and an adult damselfly look like. So uh, now we'll look uh, to the odonatal larvae. So this is a dragonfly larva and uh, that one is the damselfly larva. So the dragonfly larva, they are much more stout uh, in structure and the damselfly larva is much more thinner. And the damselfly larva, they have uh, the three gills. These are external gills. So better to call it external appendages, caudal appendages rather, uh, because they uh, definitely it helps in respiration, but uh, this is not the only organ for respiration. So this is caudal appendages and uh, this one is the dragonfly larva. So they don't have the caudal appendages because they have their respiratory organ inside their body. So they have uh, rectal gills that is inside the body and they inhale water uh, from their anus, this anal pore and uh, they take the water in and uh, pushes out. So that's why they don't need uh, separate caudal gills. Okay, so this is the basic structure of dragonfly and damselfly larva and uh, when you will uh, go for identification or go for collection in uh, any water body. So, uh, it is not like uh, that uh, only dragonfly or only damselfly larva will be there. So there will be many more other larvae. So if we uh, look at the other larvae, okay, so we have other, mostly other insect larvae I mean. So uh, we have, uh, mostly you will see uh, very similar larvae that is the uh, mayfly larva. So this mayfly larva is very similar to the damselfly larva but there are differences and uh, mayfly larva also have a similar kind of this caudal appendage uh, also uh, three in number but they have uh, abdominal gills so there are abdominal appendages visible here in case of damselflies also uh, one family is there that have this kind of projections but that is not a very uh, like ufd uh, family uh, that torrent darts and uh, if you have frizzari that is uh, malabar torrent dart and, and those uh, damsel flies uh, they their larvae have this kind of projection but the basic structure of the body is uh, very much different and i will share some of the key characters to identify up to uh, order level like how to identify the odonata uh, how to separate the odonat larvae from the other uh, insect groups so this is the uh, most I think the Ephemeroptera larva is the only one which is very similar to the damsel fly larvae. Others are very di different but still this is the stone fly larva or Picoptera. This also is very similar to the uh, damsel fly larvae. But uh, you see this, these shields, uh, these shields are very uh, prominent and they have only two uh, caudal appendages. But uh, here also the chlorocyphidae family of damsel flies, they have uh, only two caudal appendages like uh, this uh, jewels, uh, stream jewel and uh, stream ruby. So they have only, their larvae on, have only two uh, caudal appendages. So you can sometimes confuse uh, between these two insects, but uh, keep an eye uh, on the other characters and uh, always keep some uh, photographs or key characters handy in the field also so that you can identify the uh, basic like uh, odonata larvae easily so these are uh, and you will see many of the coleoptera larva so uh, they are definitely in the aquatic freshwater uh, coleoptera larva will be there so uh, coleoptera larva and uh, damsel fly or dragonfly larva you can easily identify like uh, coleoptera larva they will have a much more elongated body and uh, the, the 
head, the uh, for, uh, front portion, it will be uh, equipped with a very prominent mandible. In case of dragonflies also mandibles are there, but uh, in case of dragonfly, they are not that much visible. But in case of uh, this Coleoptera, it will be very prominent and visible and you, it can bite, it can bite uh, very uh, badly. So uh, when you are collecting insects, you have to be careful of uh, these dragonfly larvae, uh, sorry, this uh, Coleoptera larvae. And this is a caddish fly or the Trichoptera larva. Generally, trichoptera larva in water, uh, they don't uh, appear like this because generally they stay inside uh, some height, like some uh, twig or they make nest. So, um, so this trichoptera larvae also you will get and other insects are this uh, water scorpions and water boatman and uh, water striders and many, many other insects. But uh, the basic uh, difference you should know before going uh, for larval collection so that you don't miss any uh, important larva or you don't collect some other insect larva uh, uh, instead of dragonflies okay so uh, why we are uh, studying this like uh, why we are uh, collecting the dragonfly larva or damselfly larva, larva and why we are trying to know about this uh, because dragonflies they are very important insect uh, because they are amphibiotic in nature. Their half uh, life stage is spent under under the water, and the rest uh, rest part of the life is adult or uh, the terrestrial. So the larval part is uh, staying under water, not always under water. Some species are there that is semi aquatic, uh, that means they uh, stay outside water, but always near water and um, uh, either in the water or near water or in very damp and uh, wet uh, places. So uh, the species we have in India, they are mostly aquatic and we have very few species in Himalayas that are uh, semi-terrestrial. So, but they are very rare and uh, very difficult to find. So uh, for now, we will only concentrate on the aquatic larvae. So if we see this life cycle, we can see that uh, the oviposition that is the dragonfly larva dragonfly lay eggs in the water so sometimes uh, sometimes they directly lay eggs in the water sometimes they uh, put the eggs inside some plant tissue so that i will uh, tell you later in the behavioral part so after the eggs are laid uh, the hatchling that is the pro larva it comes out and the pro larva gradually grows to the final instar larva so the final instar larva uh, actually that is the final stage uh, of the I am calling it a larva but basically odonata they don't have a complete metamorphosis that's why uh, many scientists they prefer to call it nymph but there are also a di uh, different view is there because generally nymphs uh, nymphs are very similar nymph should be very similar to the adult uh, instead uh, just the difference should be in the wings but in case of dragonflies uh, the nymphs are very different from the uh, adult that's why it is not called nymph another term is there that is naiad okay so uh, naiad is specifically used for dragonflies uh, but recently uh, most of the scientists they prefer uh, to call them larva just to uh, keep uniformity okay so if we uh, see the uh, life, life uh, stages in a uh, like proper, not in the diagram, proper view. So this is the life cycle of uh, a very common and very famous dragonfly that is the dig jewel or Brachythemis contaminata. So these are the uh, mating pair. This is the male and this is the female. So uh, they uh, met and then the female is laying eggs. So this is the female and it is laying eggs on this uh, comelina twig. So it is floating on the water. So it is laying the eggs and uh, it will just touch the abdomen to the uh, floating vegetation and then it will just lay the eggs. Uh, actually it will just release the batch of egg directly on the uh, either directly on the water or some substratum. So here the eggs are visible here. Okay, and after actually this eggs I collected, 
so I know that uh, yeah, the, the pro larva, that is the first larval stage, it came out after 12 days uh, of the oviposition. So after 12 days, the larva was very small, I couldn't take a uh, good photograph. So it's very small, like uh, almost uh, not possible to see in uh, bare eyes, okay, bare microscopy. So then gradually it grows and uh, gradually it grows in a little little bigger larva and then it's a much more bigger larva but it's not very big uh, because as the species is very small so it's uh, nearly one uh, one or two centimeters uh, the high size is more than not more than two centimeter so here then what happens then the emergence happens so emergence means the final molting so before that also the larva molts so from one stage to another stage like the larva when it grows bigger uh, from one stage to another stage that then also molting happens but the final molting that is uh, from the larval stage to the adult that happens in the final uh, final molting that 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 is actually the stage when when the insect comes out of the water and takes flight to the uh, air so this this is how uh, the larva uh, comes out so we will see in a better picture okay so this is a, a sequence of four photographs actually and the it takes almost half an hour uh, to completely stretched uh, stretch its wings so you can see there uh, the wings are very small it is actually uh, sunken and uh, like folded in very small uh, wing bud and then gradually it comes out and the wings are the hemolymph it is pumped through the veins of the wings so as the uh, the as these this uh, hemolymph is pumped very uh, like in like high in high pressure so then the gradually the wings are actually inflated and uh, stretched and uh, it takes almost 2 hour to uh, dry like uh, the wings get dried and once the wings are dried then it becomes uh, stiff it is rigid so then uh, it will not like uh, before that actually wings are very soft and if you see a dragonfly that is uh, recently emerged just emerged so then you can see that the wings are soft and uh, little translucent and uh, glossy more glossy so gradually it uh, dries up and then becomes transparent mostly transparent but uh, if it is uh, having some color then the color will gradually grow after one day then uh, after uh, two or three hours actually the dragonfly becomes ready to take the first flight so now we know adult dragonflies larva and one more stage not not a life stage but the remains of the uh, molting there is a final uh, after the final molt uh, whatever uh, body part is remained as the uh, molting of that larva that is known as exuvia okay so so we now we have three different uh, parts that we can study okay we can study uh, adults we can study larva and we can study exuvia also so now the question comes which one we should study or sample so uh, here comes a uh, confusion that uh, we should study the adults or we should study the larva or the exuvia so there are different uh, views some some says that we should only study the lar adults because larval taxonomy is very difficult and often uh, misidentified and uh, actually uh, expertise is not there and uh, it is difficult to collect and if the larva is not in the final stage it becomes difficult to identify also and some says that uh, we should sample the exuvia and larva because often we don't see uh, the adult for many species like we if we uh, sample in the water body we, we can easily uh, get some larva and if we can uh, sample through the like uh, along the bank of any water body then we can have the exuvia but we often miss the uh, miss out the adults because the after emergence most of most species they leave the uh, breeding place so they will go somewhere else and we don't get the get to see the adults so uh, 
so uh, for in our view and most of the scientists now believe that actually uh, we should study both like if possible we should study both the larva and adult to get a better picture but definitely uh, larval study is very difficult so for a uh, uh, it depends on the research question what you are uh, trying to understand so it depends on the research question that if you are going to uh, study the larva or exuvia or adult animals right okay so okay first things first uh, we have to equip ourselves uh, before uh, going for collection or before uh, starting any identification so as we are uh, going to collect larvae we have to have some net and that should be aquatic net so that aquatic net should be d loop why d loop this this uh, edge this d part actually uh, if we will use a round uh, round shape net then the uh, top of the net it uh, cannot touch the ground completely because many larva are there which remains uh, some uh, like uh, attached with the substratum of the water body so you cannot touch the uh, surface uh, completely if you are using a round net so that's why we use a d loop net okay and then uh, after the after the collection we need to sort the specimens for that we need a tray that is a white pan tray if you are not getting white you can use any any color tray that is any a light colored uh, tray just to sort the specimens and definitely some other uh, like instruments you will need and uh, there should be some containers where you are going to collect the specimens okay so so now you will see uh, how we do that so basically this is uh, one of my field photographs so in the first photograph uh, i am trying to collect with the d loop net so we i have put the net in the water and take took a scoop a scoop means that is uh, i i took the uh, net in the water and i just uh, took some substratum or uh, we like soil and vegetation everything inside the net so that the specimens uh, if they are there they will, they will come in inside the net so then i will just take the net uh, out and i will just check for any if any larva or any movement is there so then see see here i have the uh, tray ready i will take some water in the tray and then i will uh, like just empty my uh, whatever i have collected my materials in the net that i will empty in the uh, tray so then i will just keep it for some time and i will put fresh water so if i will just uh, allow the uh, specimens or insects to just settle down then many many of the larva many of the insects they will just swim out of the vegetation so that becomes very easy to uh, like locate them okay so gradually they will just come out you can collect them in another separate tray so here you can see the larvae okay so uh, use don't catch them with hand use some uh, like uh, spoon okay so better to use spoon to collect them you can use disposable white colored you know, plastic spoons so if it is white in color then see you yeah, you are reusing the disposable spoon that is a good thing and another thing is as it is white you can actually see the specimens okay so then you collect the specimens in a separate tray and uh, there you have the larvae fine so in this process you have to be very patient because uh, most of the larvae these sometime play dead like they they will just simply uh, sitting without any movement when they are handled so at the first sight you may think that there is nothing in this uh, vegetation but actually after 10 minutes after 5 10 minutes the larvae they will start move, uh, moving and they will actually come out of that vegetation so just be patient and look very carefully and don't throw the um, vegetation in the bank just uh, put it 
back to the water because many other insects and many larva will be there entangled with the vegetation so they should not die so you have to uh, put them back in the water okay and uh, one more thing i will uh, tell you that if you are a beginner in the larval taxonomy so then don't kill larva no need to kill in in the beginning because just collect them uh, see how they look like and try to rear them like uh, try to uh, keep them in aquarium and uh, try to observe their behavior and how uh, they uh, eat how they uh, swim just observe their behavior understand what is their basic need and how do they live so then you gradually start get, getting the uh, uh, behavior and ecology so then you can actually understand the difference between the dragonflies damsel flies different families and different genus of the uh, damsel flies and dragonflies otherwise if you start killing the insects uh, from the start then you actually cannot do justice with the specimens so these are uh, see if you are collecting uh, that should be properly preserved and uh, properly worked out the animals the death of the animals should not go in vain so i uh, strictly discourage uh, collection and killing of insects in the beginning if you are doing a hardcore research and after at least after 2 years of basic research then you can actually uh, do the justice with the specimens so in the beginning don't kill the insects just collect them uh, watch them keep in aquarium they will grow in aquarium so then either other uh, either release them back or see the adults coming out okay so that is the best thing you can do with the specimens okay so uh, we saw the larval collection okay so now i will uh, tell you how to collect the exuvia so larva we collected fine now if we will go for exuvia that is the best option because exuvia are not living it is not a live stage so uh, if you collect the exuvia you are not directly doing any harm to that insect so uh, you can collect these uh, specimens and you can keep them with you okay this exuvia so there is no harm to the uh, ecosystem directly so where to look uh, for the uh, exuvia definitely in the vegetation and whatever submerged and emergent vegetation are there in uh, beside the aquatic body there Uh, these insects will be hanging uh, this uh, exuvia will be hanging like this and the damsel fly lar uh, exuvia looks like this okay and the dragon fly like this like this it can be like that and uh, i have seen them sometime crawling up to the um, walls also okay like this so they can uh, often uh, come out from the wall okay and damsel fly larva the uh, damsel fly this one and others these are the dragon flies so now you can understand okay where to look for the uh, dragon fly exuvia dragon fly and damsel fly exuvia fine you have collected the exuvia now you are coming back to the lab how to preserve them the exuvia so you can do the exuvial preservation in two ways okay before that i will just tell you how to uh, preserve the larva also like if you are uh, doing uh, larval collection for, uh, in a serious manner so you can kill the larva in 100% alcohol or in mild hot water okay you can just uh, put them directly in the hot water or you can just uh, change uh, uh, in 100% alcohol and then you can preserve them in 70% alcohol so um, better to if you are collecting larva and Uh, preserving them in alcohol better to uh, put uh, inc incision in the abdomen so that the alcohol goes inside otherwise uh, it may decay from inside okay and uh, generally we prefer uh, uh, like alcohol preservation for the larva and for the exuvia we can actually preserve in two ways that is one is dry and another one is wet so the dry preservation is very easy you have you have to just uh, collect the exuvia and put it in some vial okay so like this you can do uh, primary preservation 
and for the uh, weight preservation you can directly put the exuvia in 70% ethanol okay so uh, here uh, few things are there like if you are collecting a larva uh, sometime we clean the sorry uh, exuvia sometime we clean the exuvia or we sometime we clean the larva so uh, if you clean the exuvia or larva sometime you may lose some characters so they, that's why i will recommend uh, keep the exuvia or larva as it is like if it is dirty uh, if mud is there mud deposition is there on the exuvial body there should be some characters like that that all that is also a character i will come to that later but if you have more than two or three larva or more than two or three exuvia one or two exuvia you can actually process like this so here i have done i have uh, softened the exuvia just by putting inside uh, water vapor or simply in a container you can keep it with the with water for uh, maybe one uh, one day or you can keep it in 70% ethanol also for one day uh, so that then it becomes very soft and then you can stretch it so then you just stretch it uh, and you pin it in a cardboard using gum or any other adhesive and then dry it again so then it becomes a very well preserved specimen and you can easily study the specimen without taking it out uh, from vial or without just hand uh, like that becomes a very uh, safe handling procedure okay so like that you can do so uh, anyhow like uh, any way you are going to preserve them one thing is must that is a tag a location tag and date you may not un, uh, identify the uh, exuvia or larva immediately so uh, identification tag may not be there but definitely a location and date should be there and if possible uh, keep some data in the tag about the uh, ecology like where in which height you have found how it was it was hanging or it was just sitting on some uh, substrate substratum and uh, what kind of habitat uh, like from what kind of habitat you have collected like it was a running water habitat or uh, it was a uh, stagnant water habitat it was a lake or small pond where it was these all are very important characters that is going to help you for identification so these all characters should be noted okay and definitely keep them with the specimen otherwise after uh, like after few months when you will have uh, more than 40 to 50 specimens you will definitely mix up them and every data will gone will be gone okay so be careful with the uh, tag okay so uh, now i will i already told you that the best option uh, for larval study is if you can uh, rear them okay so if you can rear them and you can uh, have the adult emerge out from the uh, larval stage or the exuvia that is the best possible way you can identify the adult so that's why i will always recommend if you are uh, going for a larval study try to uh, rear them okay that actually gives you much more knowledge about the uh, habitat and ecology of the species also okay so for uh, rearing you have to make some arrangement that is uh, maybe an aquarium or simple um, like container or uh, glass jar also can be helpful so if you are uh, planning to keep them you have to make some uh, my, like habitat rather than uh, rather i will call them micro habitat so a habitat is actually a very broad term okay i will uh, uh, discuss this, that later so you have to feed the your insects so definitely uh, these uh, insects these uh, larvae are exclusively carnivorous so they only feed on other insects other uh, smaller like any any other other animals they can manage so small fishes uh, tadpoles and other insects other uh, dragonfly larvae uh, any even even sometime uh, same species larvae so it is recon uh, 
like it is uh, recommendable that do not keep more than one larva uh, if like more than one larva if they are of different size you can keep uh, same size larva sometime uh, together but most of the time if you keep different size larva together in a same uh, container or same aquarium then the larger one will actually eat up the uh, smaller ones so that's why be careful uh, while keeping them uh, together and uh, you have to arrange uh, zooplankton's and uh, other small fishes or insects for the food and take care of the uh, dissolved oxygen and the temperature level so that is very crucial for the uh, uh, mortality of the larva so if if a significant change is there in the temperature and the oxygen level of the water so they might uh, just die off so that uh, you should take care of and uh, if the larva is ready to emerge in the last final stage of uh, molting then you they need a proper emergence support so that they can uh, climb up and emerge so that can be a uh, some vegetation or just a stick or something so just a emergence support okay so these are some of the uh, basic arrangement i have used for the dragonfly larva, uh, larva rearing so this is a very uh, basic tray and uh, i have put some uh, pebbles and some vegetation inside the tray so there are actually many uh, damselfly larva so there are damselfly larva and you can actually see one damselfly is actually emerging see this is in the inset so this is emerging uh, syria grayon species so this is a very basic arrangement for damselfly larva damselfly and they can actually uh, they they are very uh, calm and quiet generally dragonfly larva sometime if you keep like this they can actually crawl out and they can uh, walk uh, to some distant place so that's that becomes very uh, dangerous for them because other uh, predators they can uh, catch them and kill so that's why uh, for damselfly actually you can use this kind of tree and definitely uh, cover the tray or cover the whole setup with some uh, mosquito net or something so that your adults like when after emergence you uh, they don't fly off so you can see what species has come out from your larva so you can identify properly okay and this is a basic aquarium setup this is completely home setup so you can easily do this is at my home actually so i have put a uh, basic aquarium and i have put some uh, soil and uh, like some pebbles and very uh, like very common uh, plants like submerge aquatic plants like ipomea and uh, some grasses so i have all i have collected from my local pond only so then some uh, other vegetations are also there so then i collected this water also from that same pond so if i am collecting that water from the uh, same pond that water itself have uh, many zooplanktons and uh, try to collect the water at night so at night generally the, all the planktons they come to the uh, surface so if you collect uh, water at night that actually have many zooplanktons which uh, which can be a very natural food for your larva so you can collect the uh, water uh, from any pond any local pond at night that actually helps uh, like that makes your work very easy and then you can uh, like put your larva inside so here see i have uh, put this this is a ichnogomphus uh, rapax that is the common club tail so with a very basic setup and i just put a uh, brick okay inside the aquarium for its emergence this is the exuvia so it emerged out on the brick so but uh, why i have put a brick but not a stick because uh, all the species their uh, emergence is not similar so some species they prefer to emerge from a hanging back posture that is they will climb in a 90 degree and they will hang back and some species they prefer a Uh, like uh, flat uh, substrata to just climb up and emerge 
so that's why ichna gompas most gomphids they are actually they prefer in a uh, flat structure so that's why i have uh, put a brick for the ichna gompas okay okay so let's move to the next slide okay this is how they actually uh, feed on so th there is a, a small video of uh, this species This is a uh, damsel fly. It is Pseudacryon. It is blue dart. Uh, Pseudacryon microcephalum, blue grass dartlet. So that I uh, reared in my aquarium, and I used to feed them with the blood worms. These blood worms I used to collect from uh, the field, uh, this uh, aquarium shops. Okay. So you can see how efficiently they are actually predating on the blood worms. So it's very easy to rear them in. Uh, this is also a very uh, flat tray. So I just kept uh, kept some larvae with the, uh, some vegetation, and this is a emerging, and this is a stick. So just to uh, some like provide them some support. Okay, look here. This is the lower leaf. This structure. See how they are going to catch them. Okay. So this is lower leaf. Okay. So this is our lower leaf. The same structure, same function, and uh, that is uh, doing, but. Here the lower leaf is uh, modified as a very uh, efficient modified hunting uh, organ. Okay, so here the damsel fly. What they do? I uh, will I will show you in the diagram next uh, in the next slides. Okay, just uh, let's skip this video for now. Okay, so I was telling you about the habitat and micro habitat. So here. This is a uh, freshwater pond, and you can see this is a very good habitat for uh, the dragonflies and damsel flies. Why so? There are aquatic vegetations. There are uh, there is uh, natural aquatic vegetation and uh, not concretized. The sites are not concretized, and the water is also clean. It's a very good habitat. So, if I am telling habitat, then actually it's a very broad. Uh, Term. Inside this habitat, actually more than four, five different micro habitats are there, and the species actually depends on the micro habitat, not only the habitat, and that's why the micro habitat, if uh, available micro habitat, number of uh, available micro habitat, it actually controls the number of species. So in this pond, see there are definitely there is mud in the substratum. so some species which prefer to uh, hide themselves in the mud they will be there uh, present uh, in the bottom of the water there is uh, ample amount of aquatic vegetation submerged aquatic vegetation so some species are there they prefer to uh, attach themselves with the aquatic vegetation so they will be residing in that aquatic vegetation and some species they are very uh, Like active and they forage actively here and there, so definitely they are also going to be there. So uh, all the different types of species, they actually can uh, exploit different type of micro habitats in a single habitat. So definitely micro habitats are more important than only a single habitat. Okay, and if suppose this pond is uh, cleaned. and uh, no no aquatic vegetation is left and the sites are concretized so then only the foragers that is uh, the active dragon flies which uh, do not uh, depend on the aquatic vegetation or mud they only can survive so all the other species dependent on the other available micro habitats they will go uh, locally extinct from that pond so it, uh, that is why uh, it is very essential to have the idea of micro habitat and when you are going for larval collection then also this aquatic uh, like my idea of micro habitat is is very important because from which uh, micro habitat you are going to collect like if you are collecting from mud then definitely you will get some species which are dependent on the mud but if you are collecting from uh, the aquatic vegetation then you will get some different species 
so from where you are collecting that is also a very important data for the identification of the species okay okay so what are the other habitats we have so this is a marshland habitat definitely uh, marshland will have more number of aquatic vegetation and uh, depth will not be much more and uh, more number of insects will be there so more food and that is why marshland i think is the best habitat for uh, most number of uh, dragonflies stagnant water dragonflies and damsel flies so this is actually a very typical habitat see this is sandy river bed so here you can see this is these are uh, there is no aquatic vegetation so it doesn't mean that there will be no dragonflies definitely there are dragonflies and those dragonflies are actually dependent on sandy flow so they burrow in sand and they don't need aquatic vegetation for their survival okay and uh, hilly streams so in the hilly streams there is very less amount of aquatic vegetation less number of uh, pre, uh, like prey food is less uh, water is mostly cold and very fast flowing so there are also different type of micro habitats and species are completely different okay so uh, why i i was telling you about the micro habitats so it is because when you are going for a collection then you should have the idea that what are the possible species i am going to get from that habitat it depends on the micro habitats available so i was telling you about the different behaviors of the larva that some larva they prefer to attach with the uh, vegetation aquatic vegetation so those larva are actually known as claspers okay and some larva they prefer to uh, forage like they don't need aquatic vegetation for their survival and they are very active and they can actually move from one place to another place so they are known as prowlers so uh, most damsel flies are actually claspers that is they dep they depend on the aquatic vegetation but most dragon flies and uh, those dragon flies uh, which um, those who uh, breed in um, monsoon pools and temporary monsoon pools they are generally sprawlers because they don't need aquatic vegetation anywhere any water body they can actually breed like pantala flavescens and there is a wandering glider and uh, orchidum sabina green marshock and uh, tramia bacillaris and tramia limbata and uh, hydrobacillus crocius so these species they are actually sprawlers okay hider definitely as it is a hider it, it will be hiding somewhere so they actually depend on the substratum and the color of the substratum and the type of the substratum uh, for camouflaging so here is the larva actually here you can see the eyes so this is a uh, dragonfly larva this is a larva of the uh, d jewel so actually what it is doing it, this is a, the body color is very similar to the substratum and also it is uh, it, it it allows the silt the soil to deposit over it it will simply sit uh, somewhere and uh, the soil will deposit on the body so it will easily camouflage with the uh, background and they are generally uh, nocturnal so they, during the day time they will simply sit somewhere and uh, during the night uh, during the uh, dark dark they will come out and they will be actively foraging for uh, prey so these are very interesting behaviors you can study uh, by keeping them in aquarium this is Uh, this is actually this i studied in my aquarium so i didn't know that they are nocturnal and suddenly one night i uh, i was checking for the larva and i saw the uh, more than 10 larva are actually uh, foraging but in the day time they were all uh, totally invisible so how i you know about their behavior okay and another uh, type that is burrower so you saw the uh, river right so this species is actually photographed from that river so they can actually burrow uh, under the sand so they do, they they directly burrow under the sand they don't need any aquatic vegetation and all so just uh, look at the video how do they burrow
see it has already gone inside the soil lines under the sand and only keeping the abdominal tip out because i told you that they respire through the abdominal tip that's why it should be always uh, kept outside the sand okay so all the uh, gomphids they are actually borrowers so now you know the behavior so now if you are uh, collecting larvae from the uh, sandy floor you know that most possible chance that i can get some uh, gomphid larva and not only gomphid but gomphid chlorogomphidae and uh, there are other species also but for general idea this is i think in the next uh, talk i will be telling you about the uh, details of the larval identification and uh, i will discuss about some uh, taxonomic characters and key characters of the larva